God richly bless our territory. May we ask three things of thee. Courage for all great leaders that they may rule our destiny. We ask for wisdom for our people that they may live in harmony. And understanding for all children that they may cherish this legacy. Oh, how radiant all your daughters and how wealthy are your sons. Your beach is both your beauty and your success is second to none. Oh, green and a brilliant are your hillsides. They replenish our hopes and pride. Oh, beautiful Virgin Islands. Your qualities can never be denied. Oh, beautiful Virgin Islands, your qualities, they can never be right hand over your heart as we read. I pledge to my country, the territory of the Virgin Islands, to encourage national pride and dignity, render patriotic service, promote justice for all, be true to God, and remain dedicated to these Virgin Islands. Thank you. Let us pray. This is the beautiful day the Lord had made and we are rejoicing and we are glad in it. Gracious God, we thank you for this beautiful day. Even the waves are pounding at our shores and we didn't know what would happen over the, the night hours, but we got up this morning and see that everything is well with us. And we thank you, O oh God, for bringing us here safely. And we pray, O oh God, as we celebrate, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would be with us. And O oh gracious God, that you will be pleased that of what we have done today in honor of this great man. These we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance, Dr. Orlando Smith, OBE, and Mrs. Lorna Smith, OBE, Minister for Health and Social Development, Honorable Ronnie W. Skelton, Minister for Education and Culture, Honorable Myron V. Walwyn and Mrs. Judith Walwyn, Deputy Governor and great nephew of H.L. Stout, Mr. David Archer and Dr. Archer. Leader of the Opposition and Representative for the 1st District, Honorable Andrew Foy. Honorable Representative for the 5th District, Honorable Dolores Christopher. And Mr. Christopher. Permanent Secretary in the Deputy Governor's Office and one of our speakers today, also niece of H.L. Stout, Mrs. Carolyn Stout Igwe. Other public officers are platform guests, children and extended family of the late H. Lavity Stout. Members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you. I am Sandra Ward and I will be your chairperson for today's proceedings. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to today's ceremony, as this year marks the 23rd year that the territory of the Virgin Islands pays tribute to our first Chief Minister, H. Lafferty Stout. Given the context of our daily realities post-Hurricane Irma and our journey on the road to recovery, the H. Lavity Stout Commemorative Committee must be commended for putting forward a timely and fitting theme that causes us to pause and ask ourselves and others the question, what would H. Lavity Stout do right here, right now? Compared to other themes over the past year, I find that this year's theme forces each of us to contemplate and reflect on the occasions when we interacted with Mr. Stout and then answer the questions highlighted in this year's theme. 
Our responses would be framed by the context in which we knew Mr. Stout, whether personally, professionally, or via the media. Our responses would reinforce the essence of who Mr. Stout was, and our responses would be an expression of his legacy as the territory's first chief minister. The lineup of today's speakers on the program also will recount their experiences and offer their perspectives on the gentleman we celebrate today. But what if I were to slightly change the theme instead of what would H. Lavity Stout do? And I ask you the question, what would H. Lavity Stout say right here, right now? I'm sure you can answer that question. What would he say if he were here and he were speaking to you at this time? He would say, welcome to? I'm not hearing you. <laughs> OK, of course, he would say, welcome to this auspicious occasion. <laughs> all right, welcome to all of you. And thank you very much for joining us for this year's uh, celebration. The governor was invited to today's ceremony, but he has offered his apology. And I will just read uh, for you. It actually says, dear Mrs. Parsons, I am regrettably unable to attend the ceremony for Mr. Stout, and for that I send my apologies. However, as the territory celebrates the life and legacy of the late Hamilton Lev D. Stout, with everyone in acknowledging his sterling com contribution as a parliamentarian in these islands for over 35 years, I know that Mr. Stout's popular saying, where there is no vision, the people perish, is still echoed by the people of this territory. So I join with the people of the Virgin Islands today in remembering a man of great honor, passion for what he believed and envisioned. May his legacy continue to live on in the hearts of the people of these islands. Thank you and the committee for continuing to honor him and may his family continue to recognize his many achievements and continue to be proud of such an amazing legacy. Augustus J. U. Jaspert our governor of the territory of the Virgin Islands. At this time, I am going to invite our premier to give his remarks as we celebrate the 23rd year, paying tribute to our first chief minister, H. Lavity Stout. Honorable premier, could you please help me welcome the premier? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson. I'd like to welcome everyone here today, and I'd like to recognize members on the platform, Mrs. Ines V. Archibald, and the left, former Deputy Governor, thank you, uh, the Honorable Minister of Education, Honorable Myron Walvin, the Leader of the Opposition, Honorable Andrew Foy, Ms. Stout. <laughs> Mrs. Stout Igwe, and the Cabinet Secretary of the Virgin Islands, also Sandra, Ms. Sandra Ward. I also like to recognize in the audience my um, the Minister of Health, Honorable Ronnie W. Skelton, member from the Fifth District, and Honorable Dolores Christopher. And um, any other members who I have not seen, cannot see at this point in time. And of course, everyone present. Today, as we commemorate the 23rd year of the late H.S. South Passion and his birthday, this year we do so with a difference. We do so after many of its projects, including our schools, our central administration complex, our electricity, our roads, and infrastructure were ripped out or severely damaged by the devastating winds of hurricanes Irma and Maria. And so it's appropriate to ask, what would this fight with the BVI, this brilliant, courageous man, have done while he's here today? I know a keynote speaker will give you her own thoughts, but I do want to reflect on today's team. There are just three points I'd like to make in my short remarks. Firstly, H.L. Stout was a man of action. Secondly, H.L. Stout was a man of inclusiveness. And third, thirdly, H.L. Stout was a man who never forgot to say thank you. 
if I may take the last point first. Mr. Saud never failed to express his gratitude and appreciation to people. I therefore begin today by applauding the excellent work done by the Electricity Corporation in getting power restored to most of this territory. Indeed, they were out braving the elements virtually the day after Irma passed, and today most of the BVI has power. I applaud these hardworking men and women, including those who came from abroad to assist us, and said to you, Mr. Stout would have been proud. We'd also been proud of all the men and women who work in all our utilities and infrastructure, who came out in the early days to get our country back on track. We would have been proud of all the volunteers from here and abroad, our voluntary organizations, and all who sacrificed to give humanitarian assistance and support to the BVI in its time of greatest need. I too am proud of you, and thank you from the bottom of my heart. I move now to my first point, Mr. Saudi Man of Action. Last week in a press conference, I said, and I reiterate today, that our focus must be on building this territory back quickly, efficiently, and strong. This is what Mr. Stout would have wanted. Tomorrow, six months after the passing of Hurricane Irma, he would have been out there talking to everyone who would listen and asking for support in getting a beautiful BVI restored to its former glory. Mr. Stout loved to talk about establishing blue ribbon committees, and so he would have done that locally, set up a committee of our brightest and best residents, whether or not they supported him politically, and sent them to work on what needed to be done to move us to the next level, while he sought to get the funding from whoever he could get it. He believed in corporate responsibility, and there are many stories of him using his persuasive powers to get donations from individuals or businesses, such as stopping the ferry with guests on the way to Peter Island in the middle of the passage and making a speech for donations. That's an often repeated story. I mark my words, he was a realist. Though not blessed with a university education, nor did he complete high school, he was blessed with tremendous common sense. So I'm giving himself with those who knew and whom he could trust for the necessary guidance. I can tell you that he was respected internationally as he quickly grasped what was needed to receive the cooperation and financial support of the international community, including the United Kingdom. And so he will have seen no need to resort to reacting billboards about Virgin Islanders and what they want to do or not do, which in itself to divide us but would instead, I believe, have sat to the United Kingdom in this instance and trashed out what was best for the BVI through negotiation. This brings me to my second and in reality my third point about H.L. Stout, and that was his spirit of inclusiveness. One of his often repeated sayings is, one enemy is too many. And he worked hard to make sure that all BVI lenders were his people. Another chance of being part of the growing economy of the Virgin Islands through his insistence that the song education was the most important gift to any child, and that second to that was the opportunity to have employment or to get into business in your country. I must also say at this point in time that he would have been proud to know that the British Virgin Islands stopped the OECS with the highest percentage passes in the five or more CXC subjects just recently. It's a great achievement. I want to congratulate the Minister of Education, Honorable Marty Walden, all the students who do those exams and all the parents who are responsible. <laughs> Mr. Stout recognized that the BVI moved to a modern economy when the likes of the late Lawrence, Lawrence Rockefeller built Little Dicks Bay, when Andy Flax built Fisher's Cove, when Robinson Neal built the Ocean View Hotel, when Richard Hawking built Bitter End, followed by the Norwegian others. Many of these people 
became good friends of Laverty Stout. And I can go on and on about them, not, in, not excluding the many friends from his home village of Little Upper Bay, those from his beloved Carrot Bay, and indeed throughout the BVI, they were all his friends. Mrs. Stout fully understood that the modern BVI was built by persons from all over the world, including BVI Landers, and he showed his appreciation. He also did not hesitate to support them by giving them what they needed by way of government support to move to the next level. I saw all this to say, I get very concerned when I hear certain utterances that really have the effect of dividing this community. I do not think that any harm is intended, but I urge each of us, including myself, to be careful of what we say. Especially at this time, we cannot afford to lose our friends who have invested here and who share the love of the BVI. And these negative feelings are percolating down to officials who have the same attitude. I recently heard of persons being asked to leave the territory. I have asked my chief immigration officer to cease and desist from this practice unless these persons have committed a crime. If we are to move forward, we must do so with the spirit of inclusiveness, a spirit of unity. We need all hands on deck at this time. It is what the late H.L. Stout would have wanted. I urge all of you to join me in getting a country fit to a level where we are proud of it. It will take us some time. It will take hard work. But let's move forward with the vision of building back a stronger and greener British Virgin Islands in a more sustainable and resilient way. Let's focus our efforts on the people of the Virgin Islands to ensure that those less fortunate and most vulnerable have the opportunity to benefit from the initiatives planned. In closing, let me reiterate that as we reflect to the end life of this great man, let us reflect on H. Life D. Stout, the man of action, the man of inclusiveness, and the man who never forgot to say thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Premier, for offering or sharing with us your perspectives of Mr. Stout. At this time, I'd like to recognize the Deputy Premier, Honorable Dr. Kedrick Pickering and Mrs. Pickering. He's also representative for the 7th District. I see our former Deputy Governor, Mrs. Rosalie Adams, and Mr. Larry Adams, like welcome you too. And um, everybody who's come from Rotown, everywhere to celebrate with us today. The next item on our program is a rendition by Zion Sounds, led by the nephew of uh, Honorable H. Lavity Stout, Mr. Elmore Stout. <laughs> so at this time, I'm going to invite Zion Sounds to give us their rendition. September 6th, 2017 Was the worst hurricane I ever seen They named her Oma and they named her well It surely was the devil straight from hell
some of the villagers, they nearly died. They swam for their lives with all their might. God bless it was day and it was a night. speaking plain if you don't change he gonna do it again but this time it's gonna be a whole heap of strife he coming to take all our lives lord you been mighty god blow the song I know that I'll have no difficulty in asking you to give them another round of applause for their originality, creativity. Thank you very much, Zion Sounds. And when you hear that song on ZBVI, you can say, I first heard it here at the celebration for H.L. Stout. At this time, I am going to invite to the lectern the representative for the first district, Honorable Andrew A. Foy, to give us his perspective on the theme today. Honorable Foy, please, please help me welcome him as he comes to speak. Today, we take time out to honor one of our great leaders of the past, the late but great Honorable Hamilton Lavadie Stout. I do so with a strong sense of gratitude, but yet with an even stronger level of excitement I'm grateful for how H.L. Stout allowed God to use him so that he could have been a tremendous blessing to our territory. H.L. Stout was a wise man because a wise man will make more opportunity than he finds. At this time, let me take this opportunity to say good day and God blessings to everyone under the sound of my voice. Today, because of what H.L. Stout did back then, we can enjoy the fruits of his labor. He planted seeds of success everywhere in this territory. H.L. Stout understood back then the greatest achievement are those that benefited others. He was not perfect, but he strived towards perfection. Some people succeed because they're destined to. But most people like Honorable H.L. Stout succeed because they are determined to. Because diligence is the mother of good fortune. He was a man that came from humble beginnings. He was born in match, but he never stopped matching until he reached great things for the people of the Virgin Islands. He marched his way to establish the establishing of the H.L. Stout Community College, where years later many persons continued to enjoy the fruits of his labor. He marched his way to take a foot track and turn it into the Windy Hill Road, where many persons today continue to enjoy the fruits of his labor. He marched his way to Road Town and made secondary education accessible to all, where many persons today continue to enjoy the fruits of his labor. He matched his way to building the Drake's Highway, where many persons today continue to enjoy the fruits 
of his labor. He marched his way to Rotong where he built the administration complex building where today many persons continue to enjoy the fruits of his labor. The accomplishments of the late but great Honorable H.L. Stout were many simply because he never stopped marching towards greatness. But more so, he never stopped marching towards getting a closer relationship with God. Through this, H.L. Stout understood that his strength and wisdom came from searching the heart and mind of God. He let God know that if he could use anything, then use him. And use him he did. As a result, success was his portion. Today's generation can safely say thank you to H.L. Stout for allowing God to use him so that future generations can benefit from the fruits of his labor. On behalf of the people of the First District, the Virgin Islands Party and myself, I want to take this time to thank the family of the late but great H.L. Stout for sharing him with us for so many years. Can all the family here stand and let's give them a round of applause to show our appreciations, all of his family that is here. We thank them for sharing with us this great man. I want to thank the people of the Virgin Islands, especially the people of the first district that supported H.L. Stout through the good days and the not so good days. Let's give my people a round of applause now because they, he turned them over to me. I want to thank all those that lobbied to have a holiday established in honor of this great man and for the Honorable R.T. O'Neill and his then administration for listening to those voices of the people through, through making this day a public holiday in remembrance of our fallen modern day hero or modern day Moses. I, am also, I also must thank all past and present administrations for continuing to celebrate the public holiday in remembrance of the great legacy of this territory's first chief minister. Indeed, he was a man before his time, but yet he was a man for his time. He understood that it was not as important to have the best people to do the job as it was to have the right people at the right time that will do the job best. Only the Spirit of the Lord could have revealed such wisdom to him. So this is why today I am so excited, because the success experienced by H.L. Stout back then came from him being in one accord with God. This excites me, because the God of H.L. Stout back then is still the God of us all today. He is still with us today. The question today is, Will we allow him to use us like H.L. Stout did back then? My people, can I tell you that once we do this, then we all can rest assured that greater things will we do now than was done in the past because God is the same today, tomorrow, and forevermore. We, the Joshua and Caleb generation, must now learn from our forefathers such as H.L. Stout and seek God's heart mind, and face. Through this, we will build a BVI post-hurricane armor that will be greater than our yesterdays. This is why I'm excited about the future of this territory, because God is still God. Let us now do what our forefathers, like the late but great Honorable H.L. Stout did back then, which is lift up our faith in God, because there's nothing too hard for him. And faith is daring the soul to go beyond where the eyes can see. My people, the size of our future success is determined by the size of our belief. The journey ahead demands that we must get a clear vision for our Virgin Islands. One where people must be allowed to be involved and therefore take ownership of. One where our people will be controllers of the economic stratosphere of the territory. One where our people are given priority while being fair to others that live among us. One where opportunities are available to all. One where intimidation and manipulation will not be tolerated. One where we turn this territory back over to the God of our forefathers. This vision can only come through us seeking God because once he gives a vision, then he also gives the provision. 
Let us move forward as one people in this direction so that the best days in these Virgin Islands will not be our yesterdays, but rather our tomorrows. May I remind everyone that the late but great Honorable Hamilton Laverty Stout did constantly remind us what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, and in similar form in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, where there is no vision, the people will perish. May the legacy of the late but great Honorable H.L. Stout live on forever. May we now as leaders let God use us even greater than H.L. Stout allow God to use him back then so that the people of this territory will not perish but rather prosper with an attitude of gratitude towards the God of our forefathers. In so doing, greater things will we do now because God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Andrew Foy, for your remarks and your perspective on Honorable H. Levity Stout. On 17th June 2017, our next performer won the attention of the judges with her thunderous vocal expression, which propelled her to the top position to become the 2017 winner of the Gen Y Factor competition. A teacher at the Seventh-day Adventist School, and quite recently I've been seeing her on uh, promoting the attire or apparel of a local boutique. Ladies and gentlemen, with her musical rendition to celebrate the life of H. Lavity Stout, please help me welcome Shauna K. Miller, Gen Y Factor winner for 2017. Um, just like Sir Lavity Stout, we will too go out into the world and light our candles so that others will be blessed by our giving. There is a candle in every soul some brightly burning some dark and cold but there is a spirit who brings the fire ignites our candles and makes it known so carry your candle run through the darkness seek out the hopeless, confused and torn. Hold out your candle for all to see it. Take your candle and go light your world. Take your candle and go light your world. We are a family whose hearts are blazing. So let's raise our candles, light up the sky. Pray to our Father in the name of Jesus. Make us a beacon in darkest night. say it one more time. We are a family whose hearts are blazing. 
So let's raise our candles and light up the skies. Pray to our Father in the name of Jesus. Make us a beacon in darkest time. Confused and torn, hold out your candle for all to see. Yes, take your candles, go light your world. Seek out the whole. I'd like to welcome or we thank those on ZBVI who are listening to us as this ceremony is being carried live over the airwaves. We thank you for tuning in to listen to today's ceremony. Today's keynote address will be delivered by one of our Daughters of the Soil who has been serving the country of her birth in a number of highly respected positions. She served as Speaker of the Legislative Council from 2003 to 2007, Deputy Governor of the British Virgin Islands from 2008 to 2016. Our keynote speaker holds a bachelor's degree in business and economics from Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida, a master's degree in religion from Stetson University, Dillon, Florida, and a second master's degree in divinity from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. During the years 1971 to 2002, when our keynote speaker held various private sector positions, such as manager, CEO of the law firm J.S. Archibald & Co., managing director of JIPFA, JIPFA Investments Limited, she decided to, or she responded to the call to put country over self. And she still found the time to serve as member and then later on as chairman of the BVI Public Service Commission, member of the BVI Judicial and Legal Services Commission, member of the BVI Income Tax Appeal Board, member of the Family Support Network and patron of the BVI Diabetes Association. In 2015, she was appointed a commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire, CBE, by Her Majesty, for among other things, having served in a prominent role at a national level. I'm sure she would tell you that among all her accomplishments, her most important role is being a servant of God. Uh, she is a Methodist, and she has served in that, in that circuit in the Caribbean and the Americas, and certainly a product of the first district as she was born in West End, Tortola. Ladies and gentlemen, to deliver the feature address for today's ceremony, please help me welcome Mrs. V. Inez Archibald, CBE. I acknowledge the protocol that has already been established and I am grateful to the commemorative committee for the privilege of speaking this morning. I have to tell you preliminarily that after I had said yes to the chairman, Mrs. Parsons, uh, they had not yet selected what the theme was going to be. 
But after I had said yes, I said to myself, Ines, if you'd had any sense, you would have declined this because given the fragmentary nature of the territory's politics, this is going to be a political quagmire. And then I got the letter from the committee, which I read and reread, and I thought, yes, you were right to have thought those thoughts. Well, secondly, by way of preliminary information, I was sitting in a car in the right-way parking lot, and a woman came up to me and she said, so you're speaking at the Laverty Stout thing? So I said, yes, ma'am, they have asked me to speak. She said, so what are you going to say? <laughs> so I said, well, why don't you come and hear? And she turned off, and then she turned back and she said, but you ain't VIP. <laughs> so I said to her, how do you know that? She said, everybody knows that. I said, everybody knows that or everybody's been told that? Because when I hit the booth, I don't carry anybody in there with me, and even if somebody's in there with me, I am not going to let them see where I put my ex. You know what I really wanted to tell her? <laughs> but I, this is a woman I've known all of my life and I respect. What I really wanted to say to her, you know, when I was a student at the West End Primary School, in that little chapel on the church grounds in Zion Hill, Singing out of my heart, land of our birth, we pledge to thee our love and toil in the years to be, when we are grown and take our place as men and women of our race. Father in heaven, who loved us all, O oh, help thy children when they call, that we may build from age to age an undefiled heritage. That's what I really wanted to say to the woman. Because, you know, when I was down there singing that, uh, there wasn't any Virgin Islands Party. And there certainly wasn't any National Democratic Party. And there wasn't any other P at all. What I knew was L-O-O-B, land of a birth. I saw a huge C, country. And that, to me, transcends political groupings, it transcends whatever concerns we may have, land of our birth, we pledge to thee. What I did not know at the time as well was that when teacher Lewis Walters and Ines Adams and Raymond Penn and Vernon Parsons and Melceda Romney and that group, when they were teaching us to sing that, I did not realize that what they were doing was that they were planting seeds for nation building. That's what they were doing. Now, it's a long, long time ago since I've been at that school in West End. I won't tell you because you know my age. <laughs> but for me, nothing has changed. It is still the same Virgin Islands that I love. It is still the same Virgin Islands that I cherish. And I'm delighted to be here, but I have a completely different perspective on Mr. Stout. I have to say, by way of preliminary information, fourthly, that I did not know Mr. Stout politically. In other words, I did not have the opportunity or the privilege to work with him. And therefore, as I look around this grouping, I can see people who are far more qualified than I to speak more comprehensively, more intelligently, more accurately, more definitively about Mr. Stout than I am. I am sure there are others throughout these Virgin Islands who can do likewise. Now, when you work with somebody closely, you sort of get into their heads. You, you almost can finish their, their sentences. Um, I knew Mr. Stout as my Sunday school teacher. That was the man who taught me to sing. You have the music? <laughs> Ere the pennies dropping, listen while they fall. Everyone for Jesus, he shall have them all. 
Dropping, 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 here the pennies fall. Everyone for Jesus, he shall have them all. Those were the days when your parents could only afford to give you seven cents to go to church. They tied up the nickel at one corner of your handkerchief and they tied up the two pennies in the other corner of the handkerchief, and you knew that the nickel was for church. But when you put in your two pennies in Sunday school, Mr. Stout taught us how to sing, dropping, dropping. It was what he was teaching us then, we had no idea. And a lot of things you learn in Sunday school, you, it doesn't hit you until you're an adult. But what that says to me now is that everything belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. Mr. Stow taught me in Sunday school about Daniel in the lion's den. And I can see the picture now, you know. Um, Daniel in there with some lions and somewhere in the shadow stands God. And, you know, he taught us that no matter what lion's den you are in, the means by which you come out of there is by the Lion of Judah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I didn't know anything about the Lion of Judah. So if I were giving this address when I was maybe 10, I would be just mouthing. But now I know from Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, drawn from Exodus chapter 49, verse 9, that the Lion of Judah can break every chain yeah. and give us the victory again and again. The Mr. Stout I knew preached in my middle adulthood from the Rotan Methodist pulpit on a passage from the Gospel of John chapter 15. I am the vine, and if you knew Mr. Stout, he said, I am the wine. <laughs> I am the vine and you are the branches. Unless you abide in me, you can do nothing. And I remember him elaborating and talking about the lights in the ceiling. He said, you can have your lights, you can have your, you can have your lamps, you can have your, your lampshades, you can have your bulbs, but if you're not connected, you don't have any light. I remember that. We remember that especially during this hurricane season. So Mr. Stout for me was sort of a spiritual guide along the way. I don't think he knew it. And then, too, the Mr. Stout I knew was the person I saw shortly before he died. I had gone to his office by appointment to discuss a matter that troubled me. And I got in the door. He was sitting at his desk. He was wearing a gray suit, pink shirt, burgundy tie. And he looked at me and said, Highness, what can I do for you, old girl? <laughs> and I said to myself, this man has a way of disarming you. So I, he said, sit down, and I sat down. And he came around and began to chat with me. I never get to discuss the problem that I went there with. <laughs> and when I was leaving, I got up to go, and he came. He, he says, I need to hug you. And as he was hugging me, he said to me, Highness, I always knew that you were going places from the time you were a little girl in West End. Now, that was before I had told him that I was going to Singapore the next day to market J.S. Archibald Trust Services. But I had the feeling even then that that is not what Mr. Stout was talking about. I had the feeling that he was using a figure of speech to say to me, I expect that you will be a contributing, responsible citizen of these Virgin Islands. I don't know whether I have been or not, but he sure planted a seed. So that's the Mr. Stowe that I knew. And so in a nod to that man, I would like for us to think for a few minutes about a leader who was obliged to lead a kingdom in crisis. I don't know if you have your pencils, but if you have good memories, you will read the passages when you go home. This man was so outstanding in the crisis that it took 
Somebody says 1% of the chapter is in the Bible. In other words, uh, three from Second Kings, four from Second Chronicles, uh, the historical books, and then there's a historical set of chapters, 36 to 39, in the prophet Isaiah. Uh, his name is Hezekiah. So you, you will have a composite picture of him if you look at those passages. He came by way of background. You know, I'm sure, that Israel was a theocracy, a grouping governed by God. They had three kings in quick succession. They had Saul, David, and Solomon. And then when Solomon died, there was a fight for who was going to be the next king. That fight divided the kingdom. And so Solomon's son, Rehoboam, uh, was, became king of just two tribes in the south called Judah. And Jeroboam, who had tapped into the discontent of the people and had protested, I think justifiably, that we want you to reduce the taxes that your father put on us. And they said, Rehoboam said, I'm not having any of it. So you had a divided kingdom, each with their own kings. So if you begin with Rehoboam and you reach Hezekiah, I think you are the 13th king in the southern kingdom. And Hezekiah came to the throne after his father had sort of, instead of turning to God, turned to Assyria, which was the most powerful nation at the time, and had paid Assyria a considerable amount of gold and silver from the treasury so that Assyria could help Judah out because Judah is just a little small country. Assyria and Babylon at the top, Egypt in the south, and Judah is sort of a punching bag. So he figured, you know, since Assyria was able to knock off all the other kings around, why don't I just pay him some money so he can help us with Judah? As a result of which, he then established a whole pagan system in the southern kingdom, when in fact God had ordered that there was supposed to be a particular type of worship. If you look in Leviticus, we'll find that. There was supposed to be a particular type of worship to him. So <laughs> Mr. Ahaz, that's Hezekiah's father, left Hezekiah a total mess. And you know, with all of the economic problems that he had, you know what he focused on first? The moral and spiritual growth of the kingdom. He broke down all the altars, all the Asherahs, those poles which represented divine deities, female deities. He broke them down. Even the serpent that Moses had in the wilderness, you will remember, that when the children of Israel were on their way from Egypt to Canaan, they were grumbling and complaining about everything under the sun. And then in one of the grumblings and complainings, uh, some snakes came and bit them up. And so they ran to Moses, and Moses ran to God. And God says, I'll tell you what. Make a brass snake, mount it on a pole, and whoever looks at it will be healed. Now, what is interesting, it's not the looking at it, it's the obedience in faith to look at it that healed these people. So Hezekiah threw that away. They had had it for centuries. The point here, it seems to me, is that if something is good for today, it may not necessarily be good for tomorrow. And so it needs to be looked at in a much broader perspective. Hezekiah also uh, withdrew from the alliance that his father had made. And that was a whole problem because Hezekiah, the man did not want him to withdraw because he wanted to be able to access Egypt through Judah. And so he, he, he decided, I'm not paying any more tribute. And so you know, the king of Assyria said, this is what you will give to me. So. Hezekiah gave, and then he says, no, I'm not doing this anymore. So he and Isaiah went to prayer. Now, Hezekiah was a good king, one of the five good kings of the southern kingdom. 
the northern kingdom's 19 kings, not one was a righteous king. But that is what Ahaz had followed. He had followed exactly what they did up in the northern kingdom. Hezekiah opened the doors of the temple, which his father had nailed shut. He had the place cleaned up. He gathered together the priests and the Levites, and he said, consecrate yourselves so that we can have worship unto God. He reinstituted the Passover, which speaks of the resurrection of Christ. You Methodists out there sitting and up here on this platform, any? Mr. Foy. Christ, or Passover, we sing it every Easter day, is sacrificed for us. He instituted, and not only did he do that, but he sent an invitation to the folks in the northern kingdom to come down. In other words, he was seeking to spiritually unite these tribes. He sent an invitation to them. They came down unclean, because remember now, they're up there for centuries with their kings, and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. So he sent the invitation, and they come down, and they go to partake of the Passover. And Hezekiah realizes, well, they have not cleaned up themselves. So what does he do? He prays for them and says, may the Lord forgive you, everyone. He could have gone in there with a vengeance. He didn't do that because the unity of the kingdom, even if it was just Judah, that unity was more important than having his own way. Now, after all of that, Hezekiah got sick. And he was about to die. The scholars tell us that in today's medical lexicon, the doctors were here with us, it may have been cancer. So he turned his face to the wall, which meant he really got down to serious prayer. And the Lord sent Isaiah to tell him, I will heal you. I will give you 15 more years. 15. In those 15 years, Hezekiah, his heart got lifted up with pride. The other thing was that he got, uh, he got stored up. He had so much wealth that he began to build storehouses for them. And then, you know, the king of Babylon sent him a thank you card. And he was so grateful for that, that he took these people from Babylon and he showed them everything that he had, everything. And so Isaiah confronted him and said, what have you done? Who are these people? And he said, these are from Babylon. They sent me a thank you card. He says, what did you show them? He said, I show them everything. There is nothing in the kingdom that I did not show them. And Isaiah said to him, that's not a good thing. But Hezekiah had the good sense to humble himself. And so having humbled himself, the Lord withheld the judgment until later on. Now, it doesn't mean that if you have done everything right, everything good, that you will always have the desired result. It doesn't mean that something isn't going to happen to you because Hezekiah was a wonderful king, but he was also a human being. And so he made mistakes. But the fact is that Hezekiah died. Mr. Stout with all of the good things that he did for this country, died. And one of these days, we are, if God tarries, we are all going to die, all of us. So the question is, what do we do now? What do we do now while we are still alive? It seems to me that <clears throat> we need to be looking if um, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the son of man, I want to tell you a little story. Uh, some years ago when I was in America, whenever I came home, I had a ritual. I gathered my children and we all went to visit family and close friends, godparents, everybody. And I was visiting one of them one day, and she said to me, you know, Mr. So-and-so is not well. He's, he's, um, he's, I think he's dying. He may have cancer. So I left the girls there, and I went to visit. I walked in, and I said, Mr. So-and-so, uh, how are you today? He said, who that is? <laughs> that is Inez. I said, yes. So he said, Inez for Rhoda and Evelyn. I said, yes, sir. 
he said, Lord, if you had come two weeks ago, you would have met a hell bong sinner, lost and undone. But he said, you know what happened? He said, man, you were kind of young, but I think you know all the things I did wrong. He said, I was in this bed one night. This was a strapping fellow. He said, I was in this bed one night, and I remembered my wife, who was then dead. And he said, I was so sorry she wasn't here for me to tell her sorry. And he said, I started to pray, <laughs> but it was so much to confess <laughs> that eventually I just said, Lord, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. <laughs> and he said, I still prayed all night and wept all night. And he said, I asked Jesus, who is at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, to please tell my wife that I am sorry. Um, and you know, it's funny because I, I stood and I listened to him and I thought, if you had come down in this house and just have some conversations with this man, you would never have needed to go to theology school. Because when he talked about the cross, he got it. He got it. That, you know, that cross, you know, you know, Mr. Stout taught me in Sunday school, the way of the cross leads home. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I ne'er shall gain sight of the gates of life if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as we onward go. The way of the cross leads home. And when Paul talks about being at home in the body, and absent from the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know, and then you come down to chapter 8, and you have, I think the King James Version says, absent from the body and present with the Lord. But the fact is that the same word that is used in chapter 6 for at home in the body is the same word that should be used in chapter 8 for being at home with the Lord. Another quick story. In my sociology class, undergraduate school, we had a question about where home was. And the fellow, red-headed fellow out of the military looked at me, he said, so where is home for you? So I said, British Virgin Islands, and I said, you? He said, I don't know. I said, um, what you mean? He says, well, you know, I'm from a military family and my parents moved up and down. And, they keep telling me that home is not a place, home is a person. So I said, what if they're right? I did not ask the gentleman I was talking with, where was his home? But I asked him, where was heaven? Because that's where he told me he was going. He said, I don't know where it is. All I know it is where Jesus is. And he said, that is good enough for me. Now, Miss Inez, if you have a different view, you can tell me, but that is good enough for me. And I left the gentleman severely alone because home is where Jesus is. What I would suggest to you, Mr. Stout has left his deep impact on my life in the ways I have explained to you. And I think while it is very important for us to honor what he has done for this country, it is equally important to honor what he did in the church. I don't see any Methodist ministers here. I don't know Mrs. Parsons. I probably were not invited. Seymour Reverend Seymour is here. So m m from my perspective, I am grateful to Mr. Stout because had it not been for him, I probably would not have J.S. Archibald Trust Services Limited. I did not agree with the comprehensive school I did not agree with HLSCC. I don't have enough time to tell you why, but what, that's one of the things I went to discuss with Mr. Stout. But he completely disarmed me. And I said to myself, you know, if this man knew or thought or intuited that I did not vote for him, 
I would never know it. Because what was important to Mr. Stout was these Virgin Islands. The Lord bless you and keep you. Oh, wow, wow. Sorry, sorry. And you notice that she spoke from the heart. She did not have a script. I don't even know how to comment on that, but very profound, very sound. Oh, wow. Thank you very, very much, Mrs. Archibald. And you notice, just like Mr. Stout, you broke into singing as you, <laughs> as you spoke. But I, you know, one thing though, I, I must get to, when you were talking about Methodists, you said only one Methodist is up here, but I thought oh, once a Methodist, always a Methodist. Is that not true? Okay, so I'll have you know that I was christened in Methodist Church. <laughs> and so was Carolyn Stout, and see, Honorable Walwyn is also saying. So, <laughs> once a Methodist, always a Methodist. But very much, let's give her another round of applause. Really sound and, and timely. And um, what she shared, if you understand the spiritual foundation of our territory, you will then understand, I mean, how she just put it in perspective. And at this time, we really should be looking to God. At this time, we come to another important uh, part of our program where we have the Lane of the Wreaths. And at this time, I'm going to ask the Premier, the Leader of the Opposition, and the Family Representative this year is going to be Mr. Stout's niece, Mrs. Shirley George Nicholas. I invite you, please, to come forward and you will be directed as to how you will, the order in which you will uh, lay the wreath. <laughs> representative, niece of Honorable H. Lavity Stout, Mrs. Shirley George Nicholas. Zion Sounds is already in place, so we will now invite them to do their rendition as we continue our observance of the 23rd annual H. Lavity Stout Memorial Celebration and 18th Wreath Lane Ceremony. Zion Sounds? Oh, we are winners when we call on Jesus. We are winners.
Thank you very much, Zion Sounds, for your rendition. I would like to recognize the presence of a former uh, representative for the 4th District, Dr. Vincent Scatliff. Yes, good morning, sir. <laughs> At this time, I'm going to invite the minister under whose ministry this whole celebration uh, falls, the Ministry of Education and Culture. So please help me welcome the Minister for Education and Culture, Honorable Myron V. Walwyn, as he comes to deliver his remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. The appropriate recognitions were made already. I'll say good morning to everyone. But I'd like to, of course, specifically recognize the family of the, of the late H.L. Stout. Today we take the time to celebrate the life, the legacy, and accomplishments of one of our greatest Virgin Islanders, our first Chief Minister, Honorable Hamilton Laverty Stout. The theme for this year's celebration, what will H. Laverty Stout do right here, right now, is indeed a fitting one. Following the devastation caused by Hurricanes Irma and Maria, every aspect of government, the economy, and life in general was severely impacted. Today, just six months after the storms, we find ourselves facing the mammoth task of recovering and rebuilding. It is in this context that we should ask ourselves the question, what would HL have done right here, right now? HL had a passion for the growth and development of the people of this, of this territory. Today, I believe he would have made the firm decision with the support of his government to focus on the redevelopment of the economy, just as he did when he realized the importance of tourism and financial services and promoted them as revenue generators, with these eventually evolving into the two main pillars of the economy. Taking a page from HL, we recognize that a major part of the recovery process would be to jumpstart the restoration of our two main pillars. The tourism industry suffered greatly, especially from an infrastructural perspective. Charter yacht and ferry companies lost many of their yachts and boats. Several hotels and villa properties and restaurants were almost or completely devastated. Cruise ships got the news of devastation and routed their calls to other Caribbean countries that were less affected. And rental companies and taxi operators were barely left with usable vehicles. Today, our ferries are running between islands again. Our yachts are being chartered. Several of our local hotels, villas, restaurants are operational. Rental companies have replaced damaged vehicles and taxi operators have been able to repair damages to their vehicles. Whatever we may be going through now, I think HL would have been proud of the progress that we have made in six short months here in the Virgin Islands. Several companies operating within the financial services sector were displaced, and many of the staff were relocated due to the lack of access to the resources needed to operate effectively. Our financial services sector, however, proved resilient 
and the registry's system was up and running in a matter of days following the hurricane, allowing relocated companies to gain access from overseas locations. Today, the financial services industry continues to generate revenue in the face of these trying times. H.L. Stull's vision for better Virgin Islands went even further and extended deep into the development of the territory's infrastructure. The progression of the infrastructural developments made over the years contributed overwhelmingly to the creation of the modern Virgin Islands that AHL envisioned. During this period of recovery today, the redevelopment of our infrastructure post hurricanes is crucial to our shared existence as a territory that thrives on tourism and on financial services. But this cannot be done alone. Like HL, we must recognize when we need help as a territory and utilize the services of persons who may not be Virgin Islanders, but can efficiently contribute to our advancement in various areas. Our history would show that it was HL that began to engage persons from other countries who then came to these shores and worked along with our people to build a territory that would eventually serve as a force to be reckoned with in this region. Ultimately, this must again become our reality as we seek to continue to rebuild this territory to surpass its former glory. Labor and immigration policies that work in accordance with our plans for future development must be put in place and enforced for us to continue on our path towards restoration of these islands. It is no secret that agriculture was the way of life and survival in the early years of our existence as a territory. Men and women toiled these lands to ensure that there was food for their families and also enough so that they could make a living. Throughout our progression, however, this reliance on agriculture has shifted and we no longer relied as heavily on this industry as we did in the past. I can recall hearing a story from HL where a little girl and her family were having dinner with a friend. The little girl announced that her father grew everything that they were having for dinner in the family garden and inquisitively asked the man what he did for a living. The man said that he was a banker. A bit confused, the little girl replied, no, what do you do? To which the man responded, I manage money. A bit disappointed, the little girl then said, oh, that's a shame. Maybe when you die and go to heaven, you can become a farmer. This showed that in those days, agriculture was viewed differently than it is today. Immediately after the hurricanes, we can all remember standing in the lines of the supermarket for several hours, feeling a bit uneasy because we were unsure if there will, will be food once we finally got inside the supermarket. These instances could have perhaps been avoided if each of us did our little part to keep the agricultural sector alive. HL, in recognizing this misstep, would have actively pursued various ways to get persons to once again recognize the importance of agriculture and starting their own gardens. And this is something that I dare say we must all now endeavor to do. As minister responsible for schools, I will be mandating that all schools, both primary and secondary, create and maintain school gardens and that agricultural science becomes a greater focus of the curriculum at the secondary level. Being an advocate for education, HL would have ensured that the education system was up and running in a timely manner, as he strongly believed that all Virgin Islanders were entitled to an education. It wasn't too long ago when most Virgin Islanders were only allowed up to the primary section. Secondary education was an opportunity for a hand-picked few. Oftentimes, they were boys, I understand. And it was rare that those secondary students migrated to pursue tertiary education. HL had a knack for good talent. And whatever he had, 
a plan to do, he would think of the right person to make it happen, regardless of who they were, regardless of their political affiliation, regardless of whether they were black, white, or Chinese. Once they could have helped the situation to move the country forward, he used them. For example, when he wanted to start a college, he called on Eileen Parsons. He called on persons such as Lorna Smith, Robert Mathavis, and Elroy Turnbull, who were handpicked because I believe HL saw something in all of them. And they all turned out to be very good contributing members of the community. So indeed, HL was right. The devastation caused by Hurricane Irma has exposed some major shortcomings that we need to address at once. Our neglect of technical and vocational areas have come back to haunt us big time. It is extremely difficult now to find local tradesmen to help with the much needed repairs to homes that are damaged. We now have to rely heavily on bringing persons in from other parts of the world to assist us with something that we should have been able to do for ourselves. The Virgin Islands School of Technical Studies, though an important step in the right direction, is not enough. There's a great need for a trade school in this territory so that we can properly equip our people with the skills in these areas, particularly since we are being told that Category 5 hurricanes may become the norm in this part of the world. HL was a consummate politician who dearly loved his country. He had, as Kenneth Williams put it in his book, he had a sweet mouth. Any of us who knew HL knew that that was so. He could get you to do whatever he wanted you to do in the interest of the country. I recall being told a story by my good friend, Honorable Oliver Sills. He said to me, Walwyn, HL used to kill me with kindness and love. He said, what love, what a man. He said, you could imagine that I was the leader of the opposition. And after HL treated me so good, I couldn't find it in my heart to run against him. <laughs> I had to cross the floor and join HL. Now, I am in no way advocating I am in no way advocating that any member of the House of Assembly should cross the floor. What I am in fact advocating is that we should follow the example set by HL and work together in the best interest of the country, particularly at this time. Whatever ambitions we have, it's not about us. It's about the people now. Put those ambitions on the back burner. And we will deal with those things at the appropriate time. But now is the time to join hands together to save the Virgin Islands for our children. Today, we remember the legacy of a man whose existence and vision has contributed to the benefits that we have come to enjoy as a territory. As we continue our path towards recovery, may we be guided by the principles and lessons that HL have taught us, asking ourselves, what would HL have done right here, right now? I must, of course, thank so very much this very good committee that continues to work every year to keep this alive. I put this committee together, it could have been about six or seven years ago, and they work like a well-oiled machine. They seem to be having too much fun. But it's very difficult to come up with different ways all the time to keep this activity alive, and I want to thank them 
So very much. The members of the committee, headed of course by Mrs. Parsons. The members of the committee, can you please stand up and be recognized here? I want to thank you all so very much. May God bless us all and continue to bless these Virgin Islands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister Walwyn. Earlier, I referenced the legacy of Honorable H. Lavity Stout. And legacy is something that's handed down or something that's left by a predecessor or someone who has passed on. And certainly, we have examples of Mr. Stout's legacy through his family. And our next speaker is his niece. And she continues to climb the ranks of the public service. So his legacy of public service certainly goes on. And at this time, I'm going to invite the acting permanent secretary in the deputy governor's office, Mrs. Carolyn Stout Igwe. Please help me welcome her. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, Honorable Premier, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor for me to have been asked to give the family's response at this year's celebration. My cousin Gwendolyn knows that I was trying to get out of this. But like we always tell the little children, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I did not have the privilege of growing up in Long Bay or spending extended time as some of my siblings did. But I well recall as a child our annual family visits to Long Bay to visit our grandmother, the late Rachel Ann Idalia Stout, and the wrongs that had to be made to the homes of all the uncles including the late Honorable H. Laverty Stout. It seemed as if at that house, we had to be on our best behavior. I had a few thoughts of my own. I did some research, but I decided to reach out to some of his nieces to get their views. What would H. Laverty Stout do right here, right now? Here is our collective response. As we reflect on him as a local preacher, youth advocate, visionary, education advocate, one who relied on wise counsel and our leader. And family, we are in this together. So when I give you the signal, you respond accordingly. Firstly, our history recalls that the late H. Laverty Stout, Ivan Dawson, and Terence Letsom were the first three ministers of government appointed in 1967. The three of them were Methodist local preachers. We have a fancy name now, lay preachers, but in our time it was local preachers. This is the prominence that the men of God had in this territory in, this territory in those days. And I wonder whether HL would be calling on more lay preachers or more local preachers to come forward to serve our territory. As a local preacher, if the late H.L. Stout had to deliver a sermon, he would have probably said, like the songwriter, in times like these, we need a savior. He would have known that in times like these, we need an anchor. He would have asked us to be very sure that our anchor holds and grips the solid rock, Jesus. And if he chose to continue to quote from the words of that songwriter, he would have said, in times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle, but be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. You see, the answers that we need as a territory right here and right now can be found in the pages of God's holy word. So just as H.L. chose his favorite quote, where there is no vision, the people perish from the book of Proverbs, he would be directing us to the pages of God's words, God's word to comfort us in these troubling times. As he was selecting the songs for the church service, he was likely to have selected one of his favorites, How Great Thou Art. 
In spite of all that we have been through, I believe he would have still ascribed the praise and honor that is due unto the Lord. He would have marveled at the power of God that is still evident in this land and sang in his melodious voice, how great thou art. Family, today we remember H.L. the? Thank you. Secondly, the late H.L. had a passion for young people. During his preaching assignments, he would often set aside a special section to address the young people, often telling them that they would be the men and women of tomorrow. He often shared stories to keep their attention while leaving them with much food for thought. In delivering the keynote address to the BVI High School class of 1983, and I'll say more about that later, here were some of his words to our class, which are still valid if he had to address today's young people. He said, this is a new time and a new world. We have got to put all the able minds together to build this nation. He said, be bold and innovative. It is your responsibility to find your place, to make a place for yourselves. He encouraged us not to set limitations on our ability and not to allow anyone else to do it for us. We look to you, he said, to carry forward the torch of the future. Learn to listen and to heed our counsel, but add to it. Make it your own and carry the baton from there. He asked parents at that time, what role do you expect your children to play in the development of this nation? He said that the strength and promise of a nation rests in the strength and promise of its young people. HL had a way of recognizing the potential in young people and offering words of encouragement to help them along the path. Today, all family remembers HL, the youth advocate. Thirdly, I believe he would say to our leaders, like the prophet Habakkuk in chapter two, verse four, write the vision and make it plain upon tablets that he may run that readeth it. I came across an undated document that was called a manifesto, which was prepared as plans were being made for the development of the BVI college. In HL's message, he said that his administration was committed to public information and participation related to accomplishing this important goal. The manifesto contained questions and answers designed to share the progress and perspectives that were being developed in regard to the college. He said that the document was compiled from a broad range of questions which had been asked from time to time by residents of the community. This document was the first in a series of many open communications designed to inform residents of the community. The vision was written down. It was made plain and eventually became a reality. In one of his remarks, he had a discussion on the criteria for leadership and he said, it first starts with dreams. He talked about the need to have vision and foresight as well as the ability to speculate. Today, all family remembers H.L. the visionary. Fourthly, the late H.L. Stout had a passion for education. In his 1987 message for Education Week, he said that education must not be seen as an institution for the very young, but must be fully regarded as a basic human right for all the people of the Virgin Islands irrespective of age. When one can identify with the struggles in a particular area, then one has a greater appreciation and thus can become a more effective champion for the cause. You see, when secondary education was introduced in the Virgin Islands in 1943, HL was a member of the pioneer class. One could only imagine how difficult it must have been for a boy from Long Bay to be selected as one of the 41 students of the pioneer class. 
So if he were here today, he would still be advocating for higher heights for us in the educational arena. In 1983, as I mentioned earlier, while serving as chief minister, he had the distinct privilege of being the guest speaker for my graduation ceremony from the BVI High School. He shared the stage with two other outstanding Virgin Islanders from his class, former chief minister, the late Honorable Sarah B. Romney, who served as a chairman for that ceremony, and the late Ines Brathwaite, a distinguished educator who brought greetings on behalf of the pioneer class. And those of you who have a good memory would remember that it went down in history as one of the longest graduation ceremonies, so much so that some changes were made the following year. And we had the most prizes, I must add, because the pioneer class gave us lots of prizes. In his remarks, he said, we are not training failures for the British Virgin Islands. We are training success stories, leaders of men, warriors of the spirit, visionaries of the soul. He therefore did not want to hear, I can't, but he wanted to hear, I can and I will. The degree of excellence you strive for, he said, will be your own passport to success. At that time, he reaffirmed his full commitment and his government's commitment to development of a community college in which the leadership abilities that he spoke about would receive their full support. He said, I look forward to the day when our graduates will not have to leave home to get a college education, but can leave the high school and walk into their own British Virgin Islands Community College. That was 1983, the same year he lost the election. But he came back in 1986 as chief minister, and the college became a reality in 1990. As an education advocate, and knowing the importance of a sound education, we believe that HL would have asked investors to contribute to a fund that would rebuild the Elmo Stout High School. Today, our family remembers HL, the education advocate. Fifthly, in 1983, HL described it as a time of testing and a time of action. So I believe the words that he used, that the words that he used, if he were alive today, would be also relevant. How would he get through this time of testing? He would seek wise counsel. First and foremost, as a man of God who believed in prayer like Solomon, he would have asked God for an understanding mind to govern his people so that he could discern between good and evil, for he knew that it was a challenge to govern people. Then he would have turned to his mother, whom he loved and respected dearly, and with whom he had a very close relationship. She, who was equally fond of him, would have advised him to kneel down, pray, and ask God for strength. Achel would not have responded like Rehoboam, as you heard the guest speaker speaking about a while ago. When the Israelites came to him to ask him to lighten the yoke that had been placed on them by his father, he would, HL would have consulted and accepted the advice of the elders that if you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. He would not have rejected the advice of the elders and taken the advice of the young as Rehoboam did by placing a heavier yoke on the people. I am told that HL relied on wise counsel in persons such as the late Alberto Robinson. And I well recall after those, those ceremonies, after we started to recognize HL's birthday, every year hearing Mr. Robinson give his version of HL. And the greatest regret is that at that time, the last one that he gave, I don't think we had videos at the time to record his last recollection of HL. Also, we had people like Mr. Edwy Hodge and his nephew who, in whom he had imparted so much, Elmore, and several other persons. HL was one who often sat with his people to hear what they were thinking. Sometimes he gave a ride to persons just so he could dialogue with them, the common man. Sometimes there was where he found the wisdom that he needed for a decision he had to make. Today, our family remembers HL as one who relied on 
wise counsel. And finally, as chief minister and leader of this territory, HL was called upon to deliver written and verbal remarks on many occasions. As a Virgin Islander, he was proud of his heritage. So if he were here today, he would remind us as a people of the importance of preserving our culture. In his message for the 1983 Observance of Education Week, under the theme, Preservation of Our Culture Through Education, he said, education is culture and culture is education. He said that one of the most important factors in a school's curriculum is the preservation of a people's culture. His words to the youth of this country were, despise not the ways of your forefathers, for in them are the seeds of all knowledge. The road to the future, he said, is built upon a solid understanding of the past. He therefore reaffirmed his government's commitment to providing the tools necessary for a sound education for all. HL would remind persons of the territory's past and how far we have come. He too would therefore sound the message loud and clear that we will rebuild better and stronger. As a matter of fact, he would view this setback as a curveball that was thrown at us to ensure that we prepare for a better comeback. He would remind the people of how they hoped and prayed for a better BVI in times past and how they saw it come to fruition. So he would remind them to hope again so that collectively we could build a happier and better BVI. As the completion of the central administration complex was one of his last major projects, we believe that he would have also reached out to friends of the territory to solicit financial assistance to rebuild the seat of government. Today, all family remembers HL, the committed leader. Before I close, let me thank the government of the Virgin Islands for continuing to recognize the contributions of our first chief minister. The United States of America continues to observe a federal holiday in honor of its first president, George Washington. I have noted with interest that despite efforts in the US to change the name of the holiday designated in honor of the first president of the United States of America to President's Day to include other presidents, the official name of that holiday remains Washington's birthday. May we in this territory, despite calls to the contrary, follow suit and ensure that this holiday remains in honor of our territory's first chief minister. <laughs> our family thanks you for this opportunity today to remember HL, our local preacher, our youth advocate, our visionary, our education advocate, one who relied on wise counsel and our leader. Thank you. Delivering the family's response, his niece, Carolyn Stout Igwe. Remember she said that she was trying to get out of this role. What? <laughs> We're glad that you didn't, Mrs. Igwe, very well. Very good, very good, thank you. As we bring our program to a close, the Minister of Education, in his remarks, recognized the committee. He asked you to stand, but for the benefit of our listeners over ZBVI, I am going to actually call your names so that uh, the community at large uh, gets to know who have been behind the planning of, the, of today's ceremony. And I am Mrs. Eileen Parsons, OBE, the chairperson. We can give her a round of applause, please. <laughs> Mrs. Parsons, thank you very much for your hard work. And then allow me to call the names of the other uh, committee members. I'm gonna ask, please, that you stand, and then you can give your applause at the end of the, uh, the last name. Mrs. Brenda Letsum Tai, the secretary. Dr. Charles Wheatley, OBE. Please, if you can stand, Dr. Wheatley. Dr. Allison Flex Archer, Mr. Vincent Wheatley, Mr. Theodore James, Ms. Yvonne McTavius, Ms. Bernadine Louis, Mrs. Janice Brathwaite Edwards, Ms. Bria Smith, Mrs. Burton McKelly Adams, Ms. Peggy Stout, family representative, and Ms. 
Gwendolyn Rubain, family representative. We want to recognize your efforts and say thank you very much. And we want to thank again ZBVI for their live coverage uh, this morning. Again, we want to thank all of you for coming out. We thank Ms. Tracy Peterson for her rendition of the national anthem and territorial song. Mr. Saniel Pickering, who is the chair of the Virgin Islands Youth Parliament for leading us in the territorial pledge. We have Ms. Brenda Smith, who did the invocation, who will also do the benediction. And our many speakers, the Premier and Minister of Finance, Dr. The Honorable D. Orlando Smith, OBE, Honorable Andrew A. Foy, Leader of the Opposition and First District Representative, Ms. Shauna K. Miller, Gen Y Factor, winner 2017. Again, thank you for your melodious rendition. Mrs. V. Inez Archibald, CBE, for your feature address this morning. We thank you very much. And Honorable Myron V. Walwyn, Minister for Education and Culture, the Portfolio Minister for today's ceremony. And Mrs. Carolyn Stout Igwe, who spoke on behalf of the family. So I'm now going to invite Ms. Brenda Smith, lay preacher, Methodist Church, to give the benediction. And thereafter, we will hear from Zion Sounds. Can everyone stand, please, just for a moment? <clears throat> we indeed had a wonderful day of celebration, and we are so thankful to God for this beautiful day. Gracious God, we thank you for the blessings of this wonderful day. And as we leave this place, oh God, we ask you to go before us, to guide us, to guard us, and to protect us. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Rest, remain, and abide with us all. Amen. <laughs> Education was always on his mind. As long as he kept it to himself, HL was doing fine. The day he told his comrades, they call him crazy. He was in plan to educate the cover. The ship from a man married. HL son was a hero. He was a champion too. Look back with pride and see the thing that he do. A vision, a vision bright and clean. I don't know if it is lightning or how I get to that. All right, all right. Just thought was a hero. He was a champion too. You can look back with pride at the great things that he do. A man with a vision, a vision bright and clear. I don't know if in this life we gonna have an angel again. Oh, it just thought was a hero. He was a champion too. You can look back with pride.